Welcome back to Restored Gospel Podcast. There is a familiar voice, maybe not a familiar face, because I think this is maybe the first or second time he's been on video, but I'm welcoming back my brother, Corey Stark, the original uh, friend that started this. This is going to be, his video is not on today, but that's okay, because this is going to be a class uh, type of video. So Corey, it's all yours. Hey, thank you, brother. And thank you all. It's good to be back. Uh, I taught a series of classes at a restoration branch in Independence recently, and I'd been there before, Living Hope. Um, this was just five classes, but Mike and I thought it might be good to summarize those classes and then continue with some material that we never covered. Uh, the class title is Gentile Fate, and that will unfold as we go. I'm, um, I know I'm not on video, but just so you're not disappointed, here's a look at, uh, I'm going to have to advance this with the keyboard, sorry. Um, here's a look at me, okay, and my wife. We were traveling. This picture was near a sand dune in Indiana, and then uh, this picture was also at the sand dunes. And uh, this picture was actually in Spain last fall, my wife and I, Margie. Uh, celebrating. And we, we came through some hard times, and I know everyone goes through hard times, but we've made up for it in recent times and um, appreciate the Lord's help through all that. But uh, anyhow, that's what I look like and my wife, and uh, now we're going to get on with the class. So uh, the first class, uh, and the way I'm going to do this is the first four classes I'm going to summarize with a few slides each, and then uh, we'll kind of get into the heart of what the fifth class was and I'll introduce those by titles as we go. But um, the first class was called Whose Heart? And the purpose of this class was to discuss this idea that it's, uh, uh, every class would begin with a question, but whose heart had to change? And in this time we were together, we were looking at class, in the class at the Gentiles' hearts. And there's several verses in the Book of Mormon that speak to the Gentiles repenting. Well, I thought about that for a while, and then it occurred to me, repent from what? I, I really didn't know what that was about. It, repentance, we all have this definition, I guess, of, of you know asking for forgiveness, but there's usually something we need to ask forgiveness from or change from. And uh, so as I looked into the scripture, and we spent the class going through a lot of scriptures, which I'm not going to repeat right now, all those classes can be found online. But we found a similar problem in the problem in all the people mentioned in the Book of Mormon, which were Jews, Gentiles, Lamanites, Nephites, ancient Israel. All of them had hardened their heart towards God. And the class was full of scriptures from each of those groups that describe how that happened and why that happened. And what's interesting about it is when you come to these scriptures about the Gentiles, the Gentiles had the same problem as the Nephites and the Lamanites and the Jews and Israel, is the warning to us early in Nephi's day when he gave these words were that we Gentiles had a stumbling block and he took that stumbling block away and uh, it, the blue, by the way, is just some Hebrewisms. I'm not going to spend much time with that in, in this video, but um, the Hebrew authenticity of the Book of Mormon comes through whenever uh, we look at it. But uh, the point that Nephi makes about us Gentiles is that he took away our stumbling blocks, and then it states, it shall come to pass that if the Gentiles shall hearken unto the Lamb in that day, that he shall manifest himself unto them in word and also in power in the in very deed unto the taking away of their stumbling blocks, if it so be that they harden not their hearts against the Lamb, and if it so be that they harden not their hearts against the Lamb of God, they shall be numbered among the seed of thy father. So this is the angel speaking to Nephi, explaining that the Gentiles would be numbered among the Nephites. And, and the question asks, you have to ask is, well, who are the Gentiles? Well, for now, anyhow, it's us, the people that the Book of Mormon came through or came to. But the warning is, therefore, woe be to the Gentiles, if it so be that they harden their hearts against the Lamb of God. And, and this is a question I ask is like, why isn't this message being shared in 
all of the branches of the collective restoration. And by that, I mean, RLDS, LDS, restoration branches, other branches, or people who've just found the Book of Mormon. By the way, all my references come from the RLDS version of the Book of Mormon. Um, if you want to know the cross references, you can go to restoredgospel.com and there's a couple tools available in the scripture searching where you can cross reference uh, an RLDS verse and chapter to an LDS verse and chapter. Okay. So, anyhow, we established in the first class that the Gentiles ultimately were forecast to have the same problem as everyone else. God would be presented to us. And in fact, in this case, God would be presented to us very clearly, more clearly than anyone else. We were given this single book to identify God and his sacrifice for us. And uh, that came to us in the last days. So, you know, how, how did God remove that? Well, the answer is by giving us the Book of Mormon. It's 100% reliable doctrine. And so the rest of that scripture states, will be to the Gentiles if it so be that they harden their hearts against the Lamb of God. You know, in class um, a year ago, I guess it was still at Living Hope, uh, I shared several verses from the Book of Mormon. It was no theory. It was no opinion. It was simply the scriptures, for instance, King Benjamin stating, God will take on flesh and come down among the children of men. And I shared about 20 different verses from the Book of Mormon that all state that God would take on flesh. It's a clear, definitive message from the Book of Mormon. And I couldn't believe the response. I, I didn't know if we were going to start a riot. There was just so much uh, anger uh, against that and accusations. And I didn't take any of it personally, but it just made me realize that what we've got is confusion because there have been different messages speaking to us regarding who God is and what he, what it is. And what has happened now is that the Gentiles have adopted our own traditions because of words and things spoken since 1830. And some of those conflict with the message of who God is from the Book of Mormon. Some of them conflict with other aspects of the Book of Mormon. But if we take the Book of Mormon to be reliable, we can determine what those traditions or maybe incorrect understandings are. One of them is this concept of who God is. And so um, he says, hey, if the Gentiles reject, if they harden their hearts against the Lamb of God, I'm going to do a great and marvelous work among the children of men. And so that's kind of how that first class uh, finished. We, we see that the Gentiles would be guilty of hardening their hearts. And, and the, the summary of that is, you know, hey, are we speaking this in, in our congregations? Is this the message we're teaching? It seems to me that it's not. In fact, it seems to me the opposite. It seems that the more maybe even conservative you go within just speaking about the RLDS restoration groups, the more people are all about, oh, we're going to build Zion. And that message is actually never in the Book of Mormon. So what I'm curious about is what are the messages that are there? Well, it begins with a warning to the Gentiles to not harden our hearts. So that's kind of the summary of class one. You got any comments or anything about that, Mike? No, not right now. We'll okay. have a link. I'll put a link for the those earlier classes if people want to go and check them out. Yeah, I'm going to put them on Restored Gospel, too. Uh, so far, I haven't updated Restored Gospel with the recent classes, but they'll all be there, too. So we'll have that link. Great. So the next class, class two, talked about, so who changed? And this um, was a summary of this scattering of Israel that had happened. Uh, ancient Israel, you know, from 1500 to 750 B.C., had scattering. We see that, you know, after Moses dies, and uh, we see that at the time of the uh, Babylonian conquest, you know, leading up to there, uh, the Jews were cast out. They were wanderers. They suffered holocausts. The Lamanites suffered actually a holocaust that was worse than World War II's. It's, it's hardly ever mentioned, but uh, there was maybe 10 times as many Native Americans killed through either war or famine or disease that 
were all uh, that all stemmed from the Americans being infiltrated by the Spaniards and by the ones who had gold as their lust in their heart. That uh, was disastrous, but it was all forecast from the Book of Mormon. And so the Nephites, you know, 400 AD, we see their genocide. Um, you know, the Lamanites about 1500 AD when the uh, Spaniards came over. But the Gentiles, and the, there's prophesied, you know, a prophetic forecast anyhow, that they're going to suffer worse than all. And the Book of Mormon doesn't, I mean, it says, if the Gentiles repent, I'm going to extend my arm. It's extended all the day long. They can come back. But the forecast is that the Gentiles, again, are guilty and will be punished for rejecting God. And that's kind of what happened in the past, but it's also a forecast of something in the day to come. So uh, in, in the Book of Mormon, you know, we're warned by this. I, I'm not going to go through all these slides. These are just a few of the slides from the class. But we were, born, we were warned about this. Um, now, one of the beautiful things of the Book of Mormon is it was not tampered with like the, the Bible was. Um, we were given words by reliable men, and these weren't just men. I believe they were really spiritual heavyweight people. They did not present errors in doctrine. They presented their words as a standard then and would be a standard in a day to come back to their people. So um, these people were handpicked for us, and it's a beautiful thing that we have their words to read. So, and what do we read? Uh, there's a warning you know, we we can't just put this word aside um, and we can't be angry because of the truth of God that comes to us from it. Uh, 2 Nephi 12, 33 states, Woe unto all they that tremble and are angry because of the truth of God. And this word speaks harsh against sin and it's plain. And no one will be angry at these words, save he shall be the spirit, have the spirit of the devil. Um, I don't know, Mike, do you remember when we kind of shared some of these things the last time uh, and some of the just angry responses we got from people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not just at class, but many times uh, we've, we've shared things on the podcast and um, there's certain topics that people will call for your head on and, and they're topics of tradition. You know, I've had people call the pastor and want me silenced, you know, for, for asking a question, yeah. For asking right. a question. So you, there is a spirit, and, and it it is a spirit. It's not individual people with their own opinions. I mean, that that's part of it, but it's the same uh, common spirit, I believe, that riles against truth. Uh, right. Not not even you, Corey, or me personally, but the truth that you present in the scriptures is what offends that spirit. Exactly. And, you know, we were discussing earlier today that, it's not like Satan is trying to get people to do 180. Of course, he, he would like that. But maybe his tact is to simply get you a few degrees off course. And the farther you go, the farther away you become from that truth or that reality. And so uh, people are quick to dismiss you know, anyone who states anything that now I'm realizing is against what we believe as tradition and here's my problem and here's the collective problem we hold things that we call gospel and we hold them dear to our hearts but those things of the gospel maybe are not gospel but maybe they're actually tradition so if that is true then how do you know tradition from you know false from from the truth falsehoods from the truth or fact from fiction um it's it's difficult because we seem to want to treasure our traditions more than truth. And that's where we're at kind of in, in this day and age. Will we come back to truth or will we just subscribe to our traditions? Uh, if you want the truth, the scriptures say no one will be angry at the words that have been written unless they have the spirit of the devil. So um, let's not let anger well up in us. I think we need to listen. And what I'm going to do for the rest of this time and, and however many times this takes to get through is simply share what the Book of Mormon states, what it teaches against things that we have done or said elsewhere. And some of those things actually come from uh, places in the Doctrine and Covenants, 
Uh, some of those places actually come from our own church history. Some of them come from things that have been written in the inspired version. And, and all these books, anyhow, it's Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, Book of Abraham, Inspired Version, or Joseph Smith Translation, as some people like to call it. These have pretty much been held as as holy as anything else. And it's like, we have to know that in some of our words, words of man have been mingled with God's words. And because of that, that's really why I'm here right now is if we can see that it's been mingled in somewhere, I can't identify all of them, but if I see some of them, what am I left with? Well, we're, we're left exactly with what God gave us. And that is this book that came out of the ground had been hidden for 1400 years, written by an ancient remnant of Joseph. And that was written to come directly to us so that we could be nurtured and nourished by the word. And so that we could take that word back to the very people who wrote it, the remnant who live today, whoever they are, wherever they are. And so that is what we're left with is this still pure word of God that I believe was originally given to us to guide us. And I don't think we've been as guided by it as we should be. Um, anything else, Mike? No. Okay. So, you know, there's warnings. Don't contend against this word. Um, th there's a promise. And the promise is basically through the Book of Mormon that the Gentiles will increase in pride and eventually reject God. Uh, the Lamanites will eventually increase in humility and return to the Lord, the remnant of the Lamanites. And that promise is spelled out that the gospel is going to depart from the Gentiles and the gospel is going to return to the remnant of the Lamanites. Um, where we get a little bit of that is 3 Nephi 7, 35. Again, this is an RLDS reference, but you can find it in LDS too. If the Gentiles do these things and reject the fullness of my gospel, and this is the Father, this is Jesus speaking, but he says, the Father is stating this, I will bring the fullness of my gospel from among them, and I will remember my covenant, which I have made unto my people, O house of Israel, and I will bring my gospel unto them. It's about as clear and concise as you can get it, I believe, as far as the forecast. All right, The gospel is taken from the Gentiles for rejecting God, and it's returned to the house of Israel. So we have this promise that are, you know, um, to about our hearts changing, that the children's hearts change to Christ and they come back to Christ, the children of the remnant. Um, it also discusses grafting spiritually and physically. When we're spiritually returned to God, he physically brings us back. And this is the promise for Israel. Um, there's a belief somehow in the church that, we are all mainly of this tribe of Ephraim and whether there is some Ephraim blood mingled in with us or not, if we were to say, well, we're really now all Israel, then the whole narrative of the Book of Mormon would be incorrect because the Book of Mormon predicts that the, the record would return to the Gentiles first. We are those Gentiles. We were raised as Gentiles. We live in a Gentile tradition, even if we might have you know, some sort of hebrew or lamanite bloodlines generations back we are presented to the lord as gentiles but the promises to israel and the promises that whatever gentiles repent are numbered among them and so they the promises to the lamanites are, are strong they're many but they predict a day when they are spiritually and physically returned to the lord and uh, they are reunited with the words of their fathers, and they are reunited with the God of their fathers. Okay, so that was kind of class two. Uh, class three had this term "sounds like." Now I'm not going to go through all the things we were comparing, but the essence of the class was this idea that when the Lamanites, who were the wild, ferocious, bloodthirsty, as far away from God as you could get people, when they were presented with the truth, at, eventually they listened and eventually their heart changed. And, and that what happened then is promised to happen again. They've dwindled in unbelief for generations. But 
what's interesting to me, and this is just one of several scriptures, is that in times past, they asked this question, what shall I do that I may have this eternal life of which thou hast spoken? What shall I do that I can be born of God? Or what can I do that I can be changed? Having this wicked spirit rooted out of my breast and receive his spirit, that I might be filled with joy, that I might not be cast off at the last day. This is interesting to me because this is essentially the change that Alma went through, Alma Jr. And although he he doesn't state it this way, he awakes from his coma stating, I have been born of God. I have been changed. And from that day forward, he's never the same person again. He, he ministers, he works, he suffers, but he's a changed person. And that's the essence of salvation, that our carnal state changes into one of righteousness, that we put off the evil ways and take on the ways of God. That's required of all. And so this is forecast to happen because of promises made in days long gone by to the Lamanites. And ultimately, through other scriptures that I'm not going to share yet, the promise to build a kingdom on earth begins with this people, begins with a people that will change. And so this uh, is also something else that is worth noting. The Nephites were warned that if we would transgress or if they would transgress the commandments of God, these things that are sacred would be taken away by the power of God. Well, who did we just read about? The Gentiles, these things will be taken away and you will be delivered up unto Satan that he might sift you as chaff before the wind. So transgressing means losing the good things of God being delivered up to Satan. So the Nephites were warned that. And then we see a similar warning to the Lamanites. Sounds like the same thing. Lehi says he's he's lamenting the future of his children who won't uh, come around, who won't come to the ways of Christ like Nephi and Sam did, uh, and that he's listing the potential pitfalls they could encounter. And he states to them, I worry that a cursing should come upon you for the space of many generations and you're visited by sword and famine and hated and led according to the will and captivity of the devil. So here's, here's the similarity. The Nephites would be lost. They would lose their strength and the sacred things and they would be left unto Satan. The Lamanites would be cursed and scattered and hated and left unto Satan. But you know what else, you know, what other group was likened unto this, what it sounds like. And this comes only from the Book of Commandments, which we have totally set aside in the church, instead substituted the Doctrine and Covenants, which has several changes in it, which, which was um, uh, the revelations of Joseph Smith that were accumulated later and modified somewhat over time. But the original wording, as far as I understand it, read like this, If this generation do harden their hearts against my word, behold, I will deliver them up unto Satan, and ha, um, for he reigneth and hath much power at this time, for he hath got great hold upon the hearts of the people of this generation. I mean, this sounds exactly like the warning that was given to the Lamanites and the Nephites. Now it was given to the Gentiles. And when? In the early 1800s, you know, at the beginning of this whole restoration movement, that we were warned if we harden our hearts against God's word, we're going to be delivered up to Satan as well. So three groups of people with the same outcome. I, again, I don't know why we're not teaching this and preaching this, but how do those things happen? How is it that we could become, you know, uh, fallen in any way? I mean, we're, aren't we the superstars? You know, aren't we the ones who are, everything's riding on? Don't we build God's kingdom and the whole world flows onto it? Well, the scriptures answer those questions individually and separately, and, and we'll get to that as we go. But Ultimately, what happens is how we arrive at this situation when God's words about us and our words about us are different. It's when the ideas of man get mixed in with scripture. And this has happened throughout time. Uh, and we hold on to ideas that aren't really supported by scripture at all. And, and it isolates us, but we get more in, entrenched in our own incorrect ideas. And so what we find is. Uh, 
things like this. I, I quoted from a newsletter that just came out a few weeks ago now, and someone was quoting from Fred M. Smith, who was one of the presidents of the reorganization. And this group of people, doesn't really matter who they are, but they're sort of promoting a, a prepping uh, group of people to kind of make things physically ready in case bad times happen. And let's leave it at that. But what was interesting was this quote from Fred M. Smith that basically said, if Zion is not the goal, then this church has little reason for existing. And I, I looked at that and I considered, how could that be? when we were given such light and truth and you know, the church has little reason for existing if it isn't Zion. Well, what did the book of Mormon actually teach the book of Mormon? And I'm just going to list some of the things the, the, the success they had in the book of Mormon was teaching the principles of the book of Mormon, like the opposition in all things, how good and evil have been presented to all humanity. And it's us, our choice, in that opposition determines the eternal fate of man, right? What if we talked about those things, the choice? What if we talked about the fall of man, how mankind's will rose up against God's will? You know, what if we explained justice and mercy and Jesus' compassion? You know, those two words, justice and mercy, um, they're, they're huge throughout the Book of Mormon. I think I was blinded to that most of my life because you know, you read things through the lens of the church, through the lens of the restoration, for instance. And it's like, maybe we just kind of focus on the things that we think are speaking to us. But what the Book of Mormon really speaks about is that God's justice is unchangeable. And the justice stated that for willful rebellion, you were separated from God for eternity. That's a huge message. And it was never included in, for instance, the popular church teaching series called Go Ye and Teach, the words justice and mercy never even were mentioned there. And it's like, how do you tell the story, the true story, as the Book of Mormon presents it, without even using the words justice and mercy? But what we learn about then is that the only way justice, which is eternal, can be overcome is through our repentance, through our change of heart, and then the appeal to Christ. And he blesses us with his spirit. You know, he, our, our body is washed physically and spiritually, and we get a new life in him. And if we endure to the end, he says, you're going to have eternal life. That's his compassion. And that's how mercy overcomes justice. But it's also the only way. It isn't just a matter of, oh, this is the church I joined. Uh, and that saved me. So um, and I know if you've been raised in the LDS tradition, there's a lot of things that get added to that, you know, and I don't even know what they are, not being LDS, but I've, I've heard things and read things. Those are traditions, you know, where it's like, okay, well, if you want to get there, you have to make sure, you know, your tithing is paid in full. And, you know, some people talk eternal marriage and different aspects that have been taught through the tradition of the LDS church. None of those things are mentioned in the Book of Mormon. I'm not saying tithing isn't important but it's not dictated as the thing that will separate you from uh, from salvation with God. So all of us have fallen. All of us have sin. That by itself has separated us eternally from God. It's only through all of our sin being wiped away, not through the number of good works that we've accumulated or the uh, full amount of full tithing we've paid or whatever. Salvation isn't measured that way. Salvation is measured that our sin is totally remediated. It's totally removed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that in and of itself is what makes us capable to return to the presence of God. So what if the church talked about the infinite atonement? All right. What if we talked about the fact that the cost of our sin was infinite and the only hope for our salvation was that an infinite payment had to be made. That was God, the creator who took on flesh. Jesus wasn't a surrogate or someone else. It was God in the flesh, as the Book of Mormon teaches. You know, what if we talked about the repentance and change of heart and how mercy can overcome justice through that repentance and the atonement? You know, what if we talked about coming in at the gate and living by the word, being directed by the spirit? All these things come from the Book of Mormon. 
What if we actually taught the message of the Book of Mormon? Wouldn't that be something? I believe that's what the commission of the church was. That's what we were commissioned to do. And Zion is, has been something that has been talked about throughout generations. It's been hoped for by everyone for the last almost 200 years now in the church, and not one of those people has seen it, although it seems to be in the forefront of our thinking. But if that consumes our thinking, what about all these other things that are, you know, now all these people basically, let me say it a different way, all these people who hoped for Zion have all died. And these are the things, the justice and the mercy and the atonement and the repentance that determine if you're going to stand on God's right hand or his left, not just your hope in his kingdom. You know, what if we wasted time teaching things that weren't going to be for the, that day? You know, what would they say now? What would they teach now? All these people who died, what would they want to want to tell us? I believe they'd want to tell us these things, all right? And that's just simply the message of the Book of Mormon. So class four talked about tradition. And, and again, um, without just stating it overtly, I tried to use several scriptures that showed the tradition of the Lamanites not being correct. And where this is going, and we'll spend the rest of this session and, and maybe however many it takes talking about how we are just as guilty as the Lamanites were for following tradition. The, the traditions of the Lamanites ultimately were what separated them from the Nephites. Now I say that because of this verse, Alma 1, 109. Whoever would not believe in the tradition of the Lamanites, but believed in the records, which had been brought out of the, the land of Jerusalem, that's the brass plates, and also the tradition of their fathers, which were correct, you know, the fathers since then, Lehi and, and Nephi and others who wrote uh, in their own plates. Whoever kept those commandments, they were called the Nephites or the people of Nephi from that time forth. So what started off as a difference by lineage really was maintained by a difference in belief. And, and it wasn't so much the bloodline. We see later in Alma when the Lamanites hearts change and they come back and they're numbered among the Nephites. They aren't Lamanites anymore. In fact, that group of people become even more faithful than the Lamanites or than the Nephites had ever been. Those Lamanites whose hearts changed, they were firm and steadfast. And so um, their traditions though had to change. And so there is a promise that someday we're all going to see eye to eye. There's a promise that someday there will be agreement in Christ. Uh, and part of the problem among us today is uh, specifically in what I see as restoration branches. Now, I'm not a member of the restoration branches, if you will. I, my, my membership for what that's worth is in a community of Christ branch. And while I don't um, uh, agree with the direction that the church has necessarily taken in some areas, I, I'm not here to contend those things either. My my purpose, my desire is simply to teach the truth of the Book of Mormon. But to do that now, I'm realizing that on all sides of the fence, not just one side, not just the RLDS restoration, we run smack against traditions. And those traditions are many and they're, they're prevalent in our minds. The biggest problem with them is that we don't know they, are, they exist. Uh, but I, I want to be charitable in this. I'm not trying to you know, break anyone down or break anything down. Um, I, I love the the church, the people of the church. I mean, they're my family, they're my heritage. Um, my my children are the fifth generation in the church. You know that to me says something. Um, but but we have to be charitable in in however we approach these things, and that's that's what I want to be in this is is charitable. And so um, what I what I did in this class in class four just. Uh, to finish the summary, is showed a few statements out of history. This is from uh, Brigham Young, and uh, he talked about revising the history of Joseph Smith. You know, Brother Richard, uh, Richard's office, uh, Hebrew Kimball, George Smith, other people had been correcting uh, things of their history. And you know, I guess when you're in charge and you've got a bunch of people behind you, you, you feel a little bit more invincible. And I thought it was interesting that 
they would just come right out and say, hey, we were revising the history of Joseph Smith. Well, well why were they doing that? Um, sometimes they were writing it to fit their circumstances. Um, now, Fawn Brody was a lightning rod excommunicated from the LDS church, you know, the last generation. Uh, but she had a uh, passion to understand our early history. She had a PhD in history. She was also born LDS. But um, for writing these things in that day, it got her excommunicated that even suggesting that the early leaders of the church had been rewriting their own history. So um, other people wrote that the church, the LDS church especially, and the RLDS to some extent had really tried to control the narrative and not, and, and, and how do you do that? Well, one way is you control what information people read and what information they don't read. Um, people had a, a little different idea back then and their, their idea was, hey, let's not show divisiveness or let's not show anything that could cause people to question, but instead let's just tell the story of faithful people who followed the prophet. So some of the things were maybe whitewashed out um, I don't know if that affects you or not, but it made me reconsider and then ask questions. Well, what was changed? And I, I don't have a deep desire to know all the details of that. Uh, there's a verse in the New Testament that states, Paul writes, I would have you be wise concerning that which is good and simple concerning evil. And, and I apply that scripture to all these things saying, you know, I, I know that some bad things and different things happen. I don't want to learn them and memorize them and, and, and put them on big banners. I, I'm pretty much of the opinion now that anything outside of the Book of Mormon was uh, subject to revision and had been revised. Uh, it, even though words were spoken and written and bound in volumes in days gone by in our heritage no matter what we believe about them, it doesn't necessarily mean they were inspired or correct. Um, I'm not going to say a, a lot about that just yet, but but I think it's important that we take an honest look at our history and realize that when we're considering gospel, we need to consider what the Book of Mormon teaches us, why it was given to us, and what it states, and use that as fact when we look at our history and words of men who have come along since the days of Joseph Smith, we need to put a circle around that and hold on to that just more loosely, I guess. That's, that's my opinion. So uh, even Joseph Smith, it was stated at the josephsmithpapers.org had been, began supervising the writing of the church history. Um, some of these things were written in a way to sort of put a new light on the early church. Um, or to even sanitize the record. And this is from the josephsmithpapers.org. By the early 1840s, Joseph Smith had begun to supervise the writing of a history of the church, which would be used to correct the inaccuracies and misrepresentations published in the newspapers. But even this official history underwent revisions and additions, often to address later theological developments or to sanitize the record. One of the things that came out of those early days was a commandment that, or at least we are told it was a commandment to um, rewrite the Bible. That's not the words that were used, but to, to basically, uh, for, for some reason, at some point in time, they, they were to work on improving the Bible as we had it, the authorized J version or the King James version. Um, that was never completed by Joseph Smith. And even though the RLDS church retained it and the LDS church didn't emphasize it or at least didn't officially make it their official Bible, that went under review and editing by two different committees of people over decades time before it was eventually published in the 1860s and then again published in the early 1900s in the RLDS church. So these things were changed and revised and revised. And we just get the end product and think, oh, it was all holy. And maybe that's true and, and maybe it's not true. So the final class, that was the end of class four. The, the final class, class five, uh, called the contract. And here I, I'm going to sort of reteach the first part of it. I'm not going to summarize so much. We're just going to go back through the slides and 
and then get to some of the slides, which really have the meat of the information that I never did get to. But any thoughts or comments so far, Mike? No, nope. no, nope, okay. just listening. Okay. Um, so th these are just some of my notes. Um, one of the things, again, and this is just from the previous class, was that probably the most significant determinant of who the Lamanites were was their tradition. And it was the traditions that they believed that they had been wronged in the wilderness in Nephi's days. And, and different false ideas grew out of that, that guided the Lamanites to be angry against the Nephites for, for generations to come. That single determinant was what kept them in the dark, though, their traditions. So I asked the question, so what traditions are, are we potentially um, uh, subject to? And uh, these are just some review scriptures. But when um, we got together at class, I mentioned this, and I know you've probably talked about this on the podcast. I won't spend a lot of time with it. You're welcome to look at these references and others. Uh, this idea that the vision experience in the grove was altered and what we and especially the lds church has held on to so dearly that two personages appeared to joseph one appearing to be the father saying to the other this is my son hear him um, that the actual experience wasn't anything like that and in 1832 uh joseph smith had a there was a first hand written account of his in his diary that was found and this and i'm summarizing some some things here on the screen but basically this account uh, of his first experience written in his own hand in his own diary from the early days only stated one personage it never stated two and it didn't have any of the wording that we've held so uh, as such a justification for uh, the, the church in existence, because there's nothing that states, oh, all the other churches are wrong, don't join them. None of that was there. What we actually get from that experience was something very similar to the brother of Jared's experience, where he is praying to God, the Father, and then all of a sudden sees the finger of Jesus Christ, and Jesus reveals himself and says, this body you see in this vision is the, the body of my spirit, and in this body, I'm going to come and visit my people in a day to come. And so this God he's been praying to introduces himself as Jesus Christ. And there's there's so much to say about that, which I won't say right now. But back to the Joseph Smith account, Joseph Smith's account is very much like that. And then what's happened is in the 1920s or 30s, uh, this book that contained this account was in the hands of Joseph Fielding Smith in the LDS church. He's had various positions and now he's the church historian. What does he do with that? He tears those pages out of the book and hides those pages in his safe. And they stayed there for years. And it wasn't until, um, and this is from uh, this picture right here on this page is from the case of the three torn pages. You can find that PDF online. This is another picture from it, you know, and, and the ultimate question is who, which vision is the real vision? Was it one personage or was it two? Well, some people think, well, what does it matter? You know, is it one or two or three or four or five? It doesn't really, really matter. And it's like, well, the problem is it does because what salvation is all about is returning fully to God. And there is only one God. And he manifests himself in his power as God the Father. And we can't endure that. We can't, sin cannot abide in the presence of God in his power. It's just not possible. I can't explain why. It's just something the scriptures teach and I believe. But to be able to abide in our presence, God became like one of us. That's what the Book of Mormon teaches. Now that really ruffles feathers of people because if you're taught, that well, God and Jesus are these separate conscious beings. There's also a belief within, you know, LDSism, RLDSism, Restorationism, that salvation is also divvied up. Well, you have this highest celestial area where God is, and the best of the best get to go there. And it, 
if you don't make it there, well, there's this pretty good level and it's with Jesus. And if you don't make it to Jesus level, well, you're still going to do well because then you can be with the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like ranking these gods. And and if you if you come back to the vision story and believe, well, there was two in the grove, or in the grove, well, two of three, you know, you you see reasons that now salvation should be divided up. But if you only see God as a single authoritative and loving father, and you realize the tradition that we've been taught about salvation is incorrect, you also realize the traditions we've been taught about God have also been incorrect, that God himself is the God of justice and God himself is the God of mercy. And he details the specific way to appeal to mercy, to apply to it, to come back in its in, in its full beauty and it's the only way we can return to the father and it's listed as through our repentance through our hearts changed through our bowing down and worshiping him and being washed with the holy ghost and in that we can be made new creatures in christ and in that we can have a new walk and we can walk you know through that gate of baptism and we can be walking guided by the spirit guided by guided by his word and return to him eventually and and be fully received with no sin at all into the kingdom salvation according to the book of mormon is having our sin fully redeemed or our sin is fully retained there is no in between and so these ideas that have come up in the restoration about who god is and what salvation is that don't tell that story, they're tradition. And and who more, and we, we mentioned this this morning, Mike, I, I thought it was so important what you stated. Uh, we were recording earlier with Gary Hawley, by the way, which is a concurrent video that's going out. But the fact that so quickly in the restoration now, if we look at it just clear without any blinders on, we see that, uh, to use the scriptural term, the seeds of the tares or the weeds were sown early by Satan. He tried wherever he could to get little weeds growing. And the Book of Mormon is, you know, this herbicide, if you will, to, to kill these weeds if we will read it and believe it and accept it for what it says. But um, anyhow, coming back to this idea of these pages being torn out, it was strictly a, a whitewashing of our history. And, the, you know, this guy was just one guy, Joseph Fielding Smith, but it wasn't discovered until about 1865, I think it was, where a man in the LDS church named Paul Cheeseman was writing a master's thesis and somehow through his investigation finds that these pages were torn out of history. And so um, what does that mean for us? Well, a lot of people just want to dismiss it now and say, oh yeah, it's another opinion. There's different opinions and different vision accounts, but it's like, no, if you go back to the real one, what is special about that, the, the first account, is how it identifies with the Book of Mormon. And it's exactly like the brother of Jared's account. That should speak to us. That should tell us something very, very important. So anyhow, that that is an interesting thing of, from our history, I think. So, and Mike, you you kind of found this, I think, well over a year ago. And I know you've spoken about this in the past. But um, any thoughts on that or anything you want to add? Um, no, I heard a podcast by a guy named Radio Free Mormon. I think I don't know if you shared that with me, Corey. Yeah, I, th I think we did. We I think we did do a podcast on that. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it was interesting. Seems to me, and uh, why do you well, I would ask you a question why, why do you think there's um, why do you think the Mormon church? decided to keep that under wraps and why do you think um maybe on the restoration side the rlds that it's uh that it becomes an issue almost like the nature of god well, i guess maybe because it's tied tied into the nature of god a little bit uh but, joseph's vision yeah I, th I think part of that reason it's it's tradition because to suggest that there was only one god speaks clearly against other scriptures that are pretty clear to read and it, it causes you to have to examine everything and it's like you know we've come so far down this path of holding joseph smith up to be 
uh, not only a prophet, but the prophet of the last days. And and then when you have scriptures, for instance, in the earliest tradition that go beyond, for instance, the inspired version where you have, you know, Genesis two and three and, and different ones where it's like God speaking and Jesus is speaking and Satan is speaking. And these scriptures have pushed people over in the direction saying, oh, well, there must be three gods and there must be all this. If, if you bring this up to them, it causes them to have to ask questions about this that they don't want to ask because it puts us in an uncomfortable situation. My, my solution to all that is just turn back to the Book of Mormon. You know what? We could actually be a really happy people if we had the Book of Mormon close to our heart. But this is where words that I'm, I'm comfortable saying, you know, we, we held on to as gospel, but I think we're written out of our tradition. Uh, and, and when those things surface, we have to either accept it or we, we reject it. The easiest thing in our experience, Mike, you and I, anyhow, is people want to reject us. They want to write us off. They want to say, don't let that person speak anymore. Don't let him teach anymore. It's like, you know, that's the, that's the Samuel on the wall approach. Let's shoot arrows at him because we can't disagree with what he's saying. And so I feel like that hits at the heart of what tradition is for us. And no one wants to believe that we might be holding on to tradition because to do that would for some people, they feel like, oh, now I've got to throw it all away. Well, no, you don't have to throw it all away. But the the answers need to be clear to us is what what is truth, you know, at any point in time. And and I don't know if if we're able to to fully grasp that yet. And what what are your thoughts? Well, yeah, well, I, th- I exactly agree with you. What you just said is said well. All right. Well, this class was called the contract. And the reason uh, part of it is this ancient idea of how contracts were handled in the early days of Israel. Um, You can research this in many places. One was a book written by a man named Meredith Klein called The Treaty of the Great King. And it describes the ancient contracts in Israel. Um, These contracts could also be a bilateral covenant. There was a couple of different words that were used, but the essential way they were executed was the contract would be written on a scroll. The same words, like two columns, one on one side, one on the other, that scroll or piece of paper was torn in half. Each party would keep aside, but it was identical written on one side. Now, if you tear paper in half, you know that one side is only, if you tear a hundred pieces of paper in half, the side that your left side is only going to join to the right side for the paper that had been won. In other words, you can't make a tear or just match any other piece of paper. It just doesn't work that way. So that brought those contracts, the two sides were brought back in the presence of the king. And so in this day and age uh, of the Bible, we, we also read this in Ezekiel where he's saying, son of man, take a stick and write on it. Now I've been told that stick, was uh, kind of a euphemism for a scroll because it was the paper wrapped around a stick. Write on it for Judah and the people of Israel associated with him. Take another stick or scroll right on it for Joseph and all the house of Israel associated with him. And we've called it the stick of Ephraim, but it, it's Joseph. And this, these two would be joined uh, one to another into one stick. Now, this is the idea is that it was like the same contract was written on the left side the same contract was written on the right side god's promises to israel that came through judah god's promises to israel that came through joseph they would be the same words and they would be one in 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 god's hand as well well so you know if we had this silly little contract mike where you're going to go buy blueberries right um you, you couldn't have you couldn't join two contracts together that weren't the same because the the terror would indicate that they weren't the same, but you couldn't have any mischief either. You couldn't change one word to another. Um, the, the whole idea of this is that the point is that we have an ancient original side of God's contract, and that's the Book of Mormon. And he discusses how uh, Nephi writes rather, that he's going to command everyone in the East and the West. They're going to speak the words that are written. 
And out of these books that are written, God's going to judge the world according to that which is written. And he says, I'll speak to the Jews and they will write it. I'm going to speak to the Nephites and they will write it. Remember, these are like left and side of the right, left and right side of the contract that are going to be joined together. I'm going to speak to the other tribes of the house of Israel that I've led away and they'll write it. But all these are going to come back and they're going to be one. Okay. My word will be gathered in one. Well, why do I think this is important? Well, one reason is simply this, you know, Joseph kept a half of the contract and the Jews kept a half of the contract. And those words, if they're not right now, they will be someday pretty much the same. But we have this untampered version that's Joseph's half that we call the Book of Mormon in our hand already. So we pretty much know that things like one God and salvation and the and how to come to him through repentance, these words would be the same to any of his people. And in fact, critics of the Book of Mormon often bring up the idea that, uh, well, Joseph must have plagiarized because look at all of these words of Jesus in the New Testament that are word for word identical to the King James version of the book of Mark. And now Mark was actually, I think, the first of the gospels written. It was simple in terms of our assessment of his wordiness. It, it had the fewest words. It was most direct because it was actually the most Hebrew, if you will. It had the least amount of translation behind it. And this, um, we find, is in many verses in Jesus' words in the Book of Mormon, word for word. Well, people criticize it for that, but the flip side is that, no, that's a proof of its authenticity because Jesus did and wanted to speak not only similar words, but the same words in Israel as he spoke here. And so why wouldn't there be continuity between those words? It's the left and right side of the same contract. So what I, th I see is that's a beautiful proof of its truth. But Jesus does go on to say to the Nephites, now God didn't command me to tell them over there what I'm going to tell you here. And he then starts speaking about the last days and the Gentiles. That's a separate conversation. But we have Joseph's half. And we, we can learn from that. Now, what has happened with the Gentiles is that we've had a, a restoration, if you will. And this restoration has, I know this is hard to see, gone in many, many directions. If we look on this side over here, we begin to see, you know, the, the church in the 1830s. And there was the Church of Christ. There was a pure Church of Christ, the independent Church of Christ. This was all before 1835. We have um, different people who then take on different names. And and these churches are are just kind of evolving. But then all of a sudden we get, you know, this great move to Utah and we get LDS branches. We get uh, different Whitmerites and, and people who, temple lot groups who come off at different times. If you go way far ahead down here, this is where the RLDS restoration exists now the independent RLDS branches, and they've been dividing since then. But, you know, in, in none of this, is there any real harmony? Um, what, what do we learn from this is that there has been a lot of disagreements over things like authority. You know, that, <clears throat> that word isn't actually discussed that much in the Book of Mormon. We've made it a big deal. And that probably is because of wording through other scripture, maybe in the Doctrine and Covenants, etc. But, this idea of um, the Gentile restoration is something we've made it to be. In other words, we say, oh, well, we're the re restored church and we're the restoration. The restoration among the Gentiles was that the word came to us. Okay. Now we may have accepted it or we may have rejected it, but the true restoration of Israel has not happened yet. And so what we find the scriptures actually say to us Gentiles through all of our splitting and dividing is, is exactly this. Woe be unto the Gentiles, saith the Lord God of hosts, for notwithstanding I shall lengthen out my arm unto them from day to day, they will deny me. This is about as clear as it gets. God's going to be as merciful as he can, but collectively 
perhaps not individually, but collectively, the Gentiles deny Christ the same as all the other people, Lamanites, Nephites, Jews, and, and different people had him to different degrees. That The Jews <clears throat> had him, he, they felt him, they lived with him, he grew up among them, and, and they wouldn't accept that he was the Messiah. You know, he comes to the Nephites and they're blessed, but within 400 years they've fallen away and they're, they're worse than the Lamanites or anyone ever was. The, the Lamanites continued to dwindle in unbelief. And here you have the Gentiles then, you know, generations later, who are given this gift of this uh, amazing book. That word doesn't even do it justice. But this, this pure word of God returns to us. I mean, how can you say it any differently? It returns to us. And it teaches us who God is, and it teaches us an infinite sacrifice that was offered on our behalf more clearly than any verses I can find in any other scripture. And we reject it. You know, we, we for some reason, it speaks against our tradition. And it's like, how could that be? I don't know. I'm asking that question right now. But Nephi writes more about this, and he says, Woe be to the Gentiles. I'm going to lengthen out my arm from day to day. They'll deny me. Nevertheless, I'm going to be merciful, saith the Lord, if they will repent and come unto me. For my arm is lengthened out all the day long, saith the Lord of hosts. But behold, there shall be many at that day. Now, this is, uh, the blue is my own comment. This verse contains the Hebrew, Hebrewism of ellipsis. Ellipsis is where it was a common thing done in, in the Hebrew. It's not really done in English but where the verb or the subject of the previous sentence is omitted and you carry on the sentence with less words, you don't repeat the same word, a verb or a noun, for instance, you just go on without it to emphasize a point. And there shall be many at that day when I say proceed to do a marvelous work among them. Well, the many are the, the non-repentant. And then that I may remember the covenants which I've made under the children of men, that I may set my hand again the second time to recover my people which are of the house of Israel. This day has not happened yet, although the signs are in place that it is beginning. And, and he states, he said, when these Gentiles don't repent, he said, then I'm going to remember the promises which I've made unto thee, Nephi, and also to your father, I would remember your seed and that the words of your seed should proceed forth out of my mouth unto your seed. And my words shall hiss forth unto the ends of the earth for a standard unto my people, which are of the house of Israel. Now you and I have both witnessed people who just reading these words cause them to become shaking angry. People who are in the church, people who have been lifetime members of the church to to imply that this Book of Mormon would become a standard back to their people. Um, the, the traditions have to fall down and fall away if you hold the Book of Mormon up for what it states it is. Any thoughts or comments? Yeah, so I think the point was made during a class one time where it says, um, my words shall hiss forth unto the ends of the earth the earth for a standard. And I think maybe the comment was, you know, he's talking about his words, you know, his word is in the doctrine and covenants, his words in the Bible, his words in the, in the book of Mormon. But this, uh, the scripture says specifically, I may remember the promises I made unto thee, Nephi, and also unto thy father, that I would remember your seed and the words of your seed should proceed forth out of my mouth unto your seed. Exactly. My, so it's kind of, it, it is, I think, specifically, if you read it in context, talking about, you know, the seed of Nephi and Lehi, so the Book of Mormon. Exactly. And what we get from this is Second Nephi chapter 11 in the RLDS book and Second Nephi 12 in the RLDS book are profoundly about how the Book of Mormon comes forth. And this scripture is sort of an entrance to all that, that the words that Nephi writes are going to go back to the Nephites and they will hiss forth for a standard and they will become a standard because they're the, at least for now at this day and age, they're the purest words of God that we know. So that goes also along with the scripture 
that is from third nephi 7 in the rlds starting at verse 34 i'm just going to read the red parts here at the day when the gentiles shall sin against my gospel and reject the fullness of my gospel how do you sin against something unless you've had it you know sin is you know this idea of willful disobedience um and well it, it's qualified sin could also be dwindling in unbelief but i believe in this case it's intended to be read as that willful disobedience you know if you willfully disobey the gospel and reject the fullness you know that that rejection is the key there uh, dwindling in unbelief doesn't mean you've, you, you've rejected it. It just means you don't know what the truth is. But if you reject it, then you were confronted with it. But if we do these things, the Gentiles shall do these things and shall reject the fullness of my gospel. Behold, saith the Father, I will bring the fullness of my gospel from among them. And then will I remember my covenant, which I have made unto thee, unto my people, O house of Israel, and I will bring my gospel unto them. This is important because I believe it's speaking about the day we're in right now, the the forecast to us. Hey, so, Corey. Yeah. I think there's a key uh, phrase there. Number one, I, the Lord saying, I will bring, and he states from and to, I will bring it from the Gentiles and I will bring it to the house of Israel. And do you, is there significance there, do you think? Oh yeah. It's God doing it. And yeah, it, I, I think that's a great point, a great observation because it, it, it could be worded. The gospel will go from them to you. It's like, you know, it would just happen somehow, but for him to explicitly state, no, I will bring the fullness of my gospel from them and I will bring my gospel unto them. You know, it's like we have this parallel, it's antithetical, uh, synonymous parallelism here. The the antithetical part is, you know, he's going to bring it from one, he's going to take it to another. Uh, and this is exactly the work of the Father. This is a mystery. I call it a mystery because I don't know the process by which it's going to happen. I, I can tell you right now, it's, well, I, I can't tell you anything. I can only read what it says. But I don't believe that however it happens is going to happen by some collective organization that is currently what we call any of the churches right now that we uh, hold up, you know, whether it's LDS congregations or restoration congregations. You know, within all these groups, there's great people who love the Word and love the Book of Mormon. I, I have a feeling that however it happens, in the future, we can learn from the past. Well, how did it come to them in the past? Well, a few prominent people within Lamanite tribes believed. And because they believed, their houses were converted. And because their houses were converted, the people changed. And we also have an instance where, you know, literal murderers and prison keepers had fire come down. And while in one minute they wanted to take the lives of Nephi and Lehi, when God's spirit washed over them in that moment, they were forever changed. And 300 people left that place and witnessed to everyone in their land. And we read of later, you know, 8,000 people being baptized and huge, huge changes. I, I think something small in the hearts of a few people will bring that change eventually. And it will, it will be like a flood. It will be righteousness sweeping least them with a flood. The, the promises to the Lamanites in the days to come are huge. The Book of Mormon writes about them and it states, hey, you're going to be like a lion who, if he goes through, can tear down and tread down and tear in pieces and no one can stop you. That's, that's what's going to happen in a day to come. It doesn't have anything to do with their military might or economic power. It's a, it's a different promise based on their hearts changed. And when they do, God fills them with his power and his love and his determination to do his will and nothing else. Question. Yeah. Um, you had a chart. It, it ties into this bringing the gospel to um, you had a chart pointing out the choice seer uh, is mentioned in the Book of Mormon and the role that that has that he has. And it seems like he 
I don't know if you have that handy or not. I don't want to derail where your class is going, but I had a question on, uh, you know, how he fulfills this, how you had a uh, comparison between Joseph Smith and the choice seer and who, who met all of these um, different uh, attributes. And I think it's important because the choice seer looks like it has a huge role in bringing uh, the Lamanites or the, the house, you know, the remnants of Lehi to the knowledge of their savior and knowing who that choice seer is also, you know, gives us a clearer picture of the story and how it may unfold and also maybe uh, take some incorrect hope or, or feeling like something didn't come to pass and putting it in a different light. You know, Yeah. And that was in the context of class three. I didn't three, three. include okay. that in the summary, summary okay. but um, we can get all those notes and people can review that. Yeah. Th again, it goes back to, well, what's truth and what's tradition. The idea that in, in Lehi's lifetime, he speaks to all of his children and he speaks to his son, Joseph, the one born in the wilderness. And he says, hey, there's someone who's going to arise out of your seed. And he describes this person. And when you, you know, when you grow up in the RLDS church, you just kind of told, oh, well, that's Joseph Smith. And, and you don't study it anymore. But when you actually study all the different details uh, that are described about this person, you realize it can't be Joseph Smith. It's exactly what you just said. It's someone who's yet to to come to the forefront. And that person would be of that lineage. And uh, Joseph Smith, even if he was of Ephraim, well, he wasn't of Manasseh. And Manasseh was who Lehi was a direct descendant from. So there's several other things, though. I, I don't want to bog down in genealogy. But this idea that there is someone else coming forth. I think it's exactly like you said. It says he's going to do much good among his own people in that day. And that didn't happen by Joseph Smith either. You know, there's right. there's, no, there's no historical accounts we have other than one time there was an effort, I think, to go among the Lamanites, and and that was that was about it. Nothing ever happened from it. So yeah, class three, it'll be there. Okay. Yeah. So um, in this kind of continuing on. So one of the things, even though we call ourselves the restoration, and I use that collectively among LDS or LDS restoration branches, Israel's true restoration has not happened yet. And I don't believe that it happens in the shadow of the Gentiles. You know, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. The, the gospel goes back to them. And it does indicate, though, the prophecy indicates the Gentiles will deny God. And like everyone else, it's because our traditions become incorrect. Uh, ultimately, Israel's restoration happens when the Gentiles are judged for rejecting God. That's, that's all the summary of scriptures we've already read. So now this is one of the things that, you know, if you're in the church, um, I just find it's interesting because we had this book of commandments, which these revelations weren't even supposed to be published apparently, um, but they were, and, and yet they were changed. And the original book of commandments in, in section four uh, stated that God was going to, uh, or God rather, uh, said to Joseph, well, let me just read it. And now behold, this, shall I say unto him, I am the, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I the Lord am God, and I have given these things unto my servant Joseph, and have commanded him that he should stand as a witness of these things. Nevertheless, I have caused him that he should enter into a covenant with me, that he should not show them except I command him, and he has no power over them except I grant it unto him. And he has a gift to translate the book, and I have commanded him that he shall pretend to no other gift, or I will grant him no other gift. Now, where this goes is this aspect of no other gift. Well, the, the one part about not printing them, um, that was removed. And then this idea of having one gift was later in the Doctrine and Covenants reworded. And it says, for this shall be the first gift that I've bestowed upon you. And I've commanded you that you should pretend to no other gift until my purpose is fulfilled in this. 
or I will grant unto you no other gift until it is finished. So in one case, we have the original wording that says, this is your gift. You're going to translate this book. I'm not giving you any other gifts. And, and, and that morphed into something about, well, you'll have many gifts. This is your first one. Um, I don't know. What do you think about all that, Mike? Um, I think that if you wanted to say a word was left out somewhere, okay. But that line where it actually says, for I will grant unto him no other gift, that that's hard to say it was a misprint or a word was left out. That's a whole um, purposeful statement. And so if you just say, you know, if you were just rewriting, I've commanded him that he shall pretend to no other gift until my purpose is fulfilled. That's one thing. But man, to have that left out twice in two sentences for I will grant him no other gift. And then again, until it is fulfilled or until it is finished. I think that's a, a pretty big leap or a dishonest leap. Yeah. And, and, you know, who knows, but I, I look at things, you know, the, the book of Mormon was the first thing to really happen in Joseph Smith's life. And to say this was your gift and this is what you're going to get. Well, the, who is Joseph Smith after that gift is is done? Well, he was Joe Smith, you know, but but for everyone around him, it's like they didn't want that to be it. I'm sure they, you know, how did they respond? Well, they made him mayor later. They wanted him to run for president. You know, they're here, bring us lots of revelations. Oh, here's this Egyptian papyrus, translate that. And, you know, I, I know that's a big deal, especially in the LDS tradition, at least among some, that he continued to do these things, but these things, as, as we're going to see, have been disproven. The Whatever authenticity the people believe Joseph had to do that then hasn't been proven by the facts that we have about it. And yet there is no disputing that the Book of Mormon was a true, honest translation from an original Hebrew text. I've even asked the AI series, like chat GPT, maybe you've delved into that, you know, and it's finding all these Hebrewisms. And you ask the question, how is it he could have plagiarized this from any other book? And even the artificial intelligence of our time states there were no other books around. There was no place this could have been plagiarized from. You know, uh, I, I, I see this now differently. And I my summary, and this is probably even jump into the conclusion of what class five was all about, is that you take the Book of Mormon and you hold it up for what God gave it to us to be this pure word of God from him. What a gift so we wouldn't stumble. And then you put a circle around everything else and you hold on to it more loosely. But instead, we've kind of put the Book of Mormon off to the side and we've put a circle around everything that happened ever after that. We've held on to that tightly. And there's a lot of things that come into question, you know, things like, you know, one God versus three gods, things about salvation, but also other things like a Melchizedek order of priesthood. That's one of the things we're going to get to in the class, uh, this idea of uh, an, an Enoch city coming down. And the reason I bring it up is because the Book of Mormon doesn't mention a Melchizedek order. It mentions Melchizedek, but it never an order of his priesthood. It never mentions a man named Enoch or an Enoch city. In fact, we have an idea. If you ask anyone in the church, tell me about the everlasting covenant, they're going to go to Genesis 9 and, and talk about this, uh, you know, God's kingdom coming down to earth again. But the everlasting covenant that's mentioned in the Book of Mormon isn't that at all. The everlasting covenant it discusses is the promise to regather Israel. And, you know, some people can argue, and I, I know when we visited with John Tandy, uh, you know, that, well, that information wasn't given then, but it was explained through Joseph Smith. I, I see it all differently now. I see it as, no, his gift was to translate the Book of Mormon. And the things that came after that, they've become our tradition, I, I believe. And there's there's certain justifications I, I'd like to give to kind of support that as we go. Yeah. I, so I, I was thinking, um, I didn't want, when I, when I see this Book of Commandments, and I don't want that to be, in my personal walk, the only thing I consider uh, as to why our traditions and things in the Doctrine and Covenants um, are not all correct, in my opinion, or even close. 
not just because of this one change, but uh, as I've said to, to another person, it's a puzzle and you have to take the, if you take the whole body of work and basically just say, if you don't want to believe this change was made, that's okay. But look at, look at the fruits of the leadership. Yes. It was just, it was, it was really, it was pretty horrible from going forth from once the Book of Mormon was produced and then throughout the rest of history till he was assassinated. Um, there was a lot of uh, false prophecies, misunderstandings and timelines of Zion. Uh, just, I think, a real lack of prophetic leadership if he was indeed a prophet. So it's not just this, although this is pretty uh, pretty condemning, it's not just this one little change, but, uh, you know, a body of work for the next 15 years or so, you know. Right. I, 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 I concur. Um, you know, when you look at the beginning of his life versus the end of his life, and one of the last things he he brought was in our Doctrine and Covenants in section 107 that talked about baptism of the dead. Well, you know, a, a group of saints in the 1970s decided, you know, this doesn't sound right. Let's have it removed. So it was kind of like historically removed out of the context of the Book of Mormon and put past the appendix, you know, and it was like, okay, it's still here, but we're not calling it scripture anymore. It's like they didn't want to remove it completely. They just took it out of the line of other scriptures. And what's interesting about this idea of baptism for the dead, not to bog down on it, but it's it's one of these things that if you read the Book of Mormon, there's no need for it because it says, hey, people who are not under the law, um, they're not they're not judged. The mercy of Christ atones for them. And this this is kind of goes flat in the face of, well, even this whole idea of baptism and baptism for the dead, it's like, why would it be needed if Jesus already said that? I just share that because it's an example, like once you just get farther and farther away from the Book of Mormon, you can get caught up in these other ideas that just worked on the minds of people. The baptism for the dead came from a woman whose brother died, and she sort of talked to Joseph and thought, wouldn't it be a good idea if he was kind of proxy baptized? Well, that grew into this movement and, you know, some people fought against it, but it was just sort of an idea back then. And then it becomes this, you know, mainstream happening of the church. Well, one of the things that's important to understand about that is because that ended up having money flow into the church. How and why? It was simply because Joseph Smith died when this Nauvoo temple was being, you know, remodeled and, and, and built. But when Joseph died, it was the perfect opportunity for Brigham and others to, to literally stand on his grave and say, hey, if you believed in this prophet, we'll send your money. We're going to build a, a stone baptismal font uh, instead of this stinky wood one. And, you know, if you want to see it completed, send your money. And well, these guys also at the time were practicing polygamy and Br Brigham ends up with, I think, 52 or 55 wives. How do you how do you support 50 people to feed them dinner every night, you know, on one paycheck? It's like, I don't know how they did it, but these men who were the, the early polygamists figured out a pretty good shtick. And the whole thing was, hey, if you build a temple, tell people they got to be married in it if they want to be uh, in celestial glory and tell people we need to baptize your family members so they can be there with you. So that brings the heart into it. It's kind of like, Oh my gosh, I want my family to be with me in heaven. Let's baptize them. And so if you want to have that happen, we have to finish this temple, start pouring in your money. And there were letters written to the saints in these 1844, 1845, you know, telling them this is how you do it. Send your money into us. It'll be managed by us, the 12 who are left. I think at least 10 of the 12 were practicing polygamy at that point in time. And so what ends up happening is that process cycles over and over and over again in the, in the LDS world. It didn't really happen again in the RLDS world, but this idea of, you know, it was, if you had a business model, it was, it worked pretty well for them. It's like, tell people you have to have temples because we have to be in celestial glory and we have to be sealed in these temples and we have to baptize our dead. And so it brings the living, it brings the dead, it brings all these people and it brings a whole lot of cash flow. And this, uh, anyhow, has, has been just one of the traditions of people that started back then and it's snowballed into something huge now, but it was simply a tradition and that it wasn't necessary according to the gospel as given in the book of Mormon. Yeah. Qu an example I heard just recently is a friend of mine was talking to a missionary and, um, they were discussing 
you know, well, what about baptism for the dead? And my friend said, and, and Joseph bringing that forth, that wasn't, you know, correct. That, that, that shouldn't be part of our scriptural canon. And, and the response was, you know, well, he was taken away early and, you know, he understood things about it that we don't know. And right. so it'll be explained in more detail later. And that's kind of a, an idea of, or an example of the idolatry of Joseph Smith, uh, rather than, than say he was wrong, uh, we say, well, we don't understand what he understood and we will someday, you know, if he said it, then it's gotta be uh, of the, you know, of the Lord. Cause he, he was a prophet. And so there's still a lot of uh, idolatry about that, about him. Right. Still there, there, there has been and continues to be. Well, you know, that was a quote from Brigham Young, not in this class series, but the previous one that um, I, I don't have prepared right now, but the essence of it was Brigham speaking to the people saying, you know, Joseph told me things that he didn't tell you yet, but you can expect to hear things you never heard before, you know, prepping their minds for new wording and essentially any direction he wanted to take them, he could because he was in control. And so that, that idolatry came in early, like you said earlier today, sowing the seeds, sowing the tares early. And that's, that's where they started growing. So um, in class five, I shared this too. And I, I like this quote from Carl Sagan. What an astonishing thing a book is. It's a flat object made from a tree with flexible parts on which are imprinted lots of funny dark squiggles. But one glance at it, and you're inside the mind of another person, maybe somebody dead for thousands of years. Across the millennia, an author is speaking clearly and silently inside your head, directly to you. Writing is perhaps the greatest of human inventions, binding together people who never knew each other, citizens of distant epochs. Books break the shackles of time. And I, I like that. And, you know, he concludes saying a book is proof that humans are capable of working magic. I, I, I love that in terms of what it means for any book, but specifically the Book of Mormon. You know, the men who wrote this book were, were really handpicked by God and they, they, they lived in a different day and age. They didn't live with the technology we have, although I think they lived with things we might call technology that of theirs that we don't have. But they were spiritual heavyweights. I mean, Jacob, it writes of him and Nephi that they could command the sea and, you know, they could, they could move the mountains with their word. Uh, these are gifts that are not ours right now. It's safe to say, but when God gives us words that they spent years tapping in the metal plates, we suddenly get inside of their mind. We, we understand their thoughts. You know, what a blessing it is that we have, the cross section of a family leaving Jerusalem who really didn't know Christ until he's revealed in vision to the dad. And then the, the children get their own visions of Christ and what it means. And they, in the words they have written were so true and to the point about him and, and they're given to us across the millennia. They're just, they're in front of us for us to read and accept. Now my contention has been through these classes that, while we in the church all know the Book of Mormon storyline, we we don't often understand the doctrine of the Book of Mormon, and that is the difference. You know, we we know Nephi built a boat, and we know Ammon chopped off arms, and we know different things that Jesus came and visited the Nephites, but it's in those stories where the doctrine is explained, and it's the doctrine that unfortunately gets buried by our traditions. And so it's important that we come back to the words as they are written and try to assimilate them to become the fabric of who we are. And, you know, this is something that uh, for people listening, you know, Mike and I say, oh, yeah, when we talk this morning, whatever, Mike and I love each other. We're, we're brothers. Uh, we, we don't always see everything the same way, but I think it's cool that we, we agree on, on these things that are important and what, um, you know, what we don't see the same way is more about, oh, well, he likes certain kind of food and I like something else. But nevertheless, on mm -hmm. the gospel things, I think we're pretty much in tune. And this, it's a, it's a, it's a growing movement. I, I'm just seeing, and, and I think you are too, Mike, people around us who are, they're coming from different walks. You might have an LDS tradition or RLDS, or you might have kind of lived 
without anyone for your whole life because you sort of saw things differently and you didn't know where to turn. These people are coming from different groups and they're and they're not coming to us, they're not coming to you and me, but they're coming to the truth, I think, that's in the Book of Mormon. And and all we can do is point them towards, hey, you want to see the Father? Here he is right here in the in the pages. And this is a, a beautiful thing that it's, it's I wouldn't call it a movement, but maybe it is a movement of, of people being reassured by the truth. You know, I, I don't know, any thoughts on that, Mike? I love this quote from Carl Sagan because sometimes we sit down and pick up a book and read it and it just seems so ordinary. But this really makes you stop and think about what you are doing and you're reading the, you know, you're reading the product of a spiritual, um, a spiritual condition, a spiritual event that someone had with the great creator and they're carving it in metal so that we can understand the revelation that our creator gave to them. And as you said, those, they were giants. They were selected to do this and put this stuff down. Uh, to me, that's, fascinating and this kind of pulls you into that and and allows you to just realize what a gift that is and what a gift every day i'm thankful that i was born and raised in a place that i could have the book of mormon to explain my creator to me and to be able to accept it so i that's kind of where my thoughts went and then i told you earlier how cool is it to sit here and to you know bring the words of nephi that was written on plates in a book and then put it out into the air where it can go around the world right now and just have people hear it. That's Amen. So amazing to me. Yeah, it is. It's, I don't know, it's, it's more than humbling. And it's like, you, you realize our words are so limited when you consider what you just said, that, that the minds of these people are open to us and we can, we can share it. We can learn, we can love. It's like, I'm equally humbled every day to think, God, how was it that, me, you know, I'm, I'm so inadequate, and but but I was able at this point in time in 2023 in this generation of life on the earth to hold your word, and it's like I just pray that we can do something that can please God with it, not just sit on it, uh, not give it away or sell it, uh, not substitute a false tradition for what it says. It's like I am so comforted by the the things that I've begun to learn from it. They, they take away any fear I've got from losing something that was part of a tradition of people. It's like, but the truth is so much greater. It's like, you know, I'm okay letting these things go and these traditions that have motivated Gentiles to believe certain things that we're going to do are ahead of us. Uh, like I said, I'm willing to put a circle around all that and just push it off to the side for a little while and say, okay, maybe enough of that. Let's let's come back and see what the Book of Mormon says. It's got an important message for us. What can we learn from that? And and, and how can we learn to be more loving through that? Um, one of the things that doesn't seem to exist when you trans when you read from the Book of Mormon and it smacks against tradition is you don't see a lot of charity among the Gentiles. And this is a caution because the Book of Mormon warns, hey, if the Gentiles don't have charity, well, they're going to be judged for that. And mm -hmm. and and we're we're seeing that around us and it's important that we recognize it early if we're guilty of holding on to tradition more than the word, because that's ultimately going to judge us someday. Yes. We've experienced that lack of charity uh, from, from those that would be held up as those that are supposed to be examples, you know, and anger and things. So yeah. it's very telling, but you're, um, I don't know what your next slide is. You're at about an hour and a half and how are you holding up and teach? I know you've got quite a bit um, to teach. Yeah, we got quite a bit more. Um, you know, I, this might be a good break point right here, uh, because I think we probably need another hour and a half to get through the rest of it. Um, okay. and I don't want to make this overwhelming. Uh, I know you're getting ready to go on some vacation, but maybe we can get together when you get back. Uh, or even if you want to do it on vacation, I'm not trying to yeah, say absolutely. that, but I could, yep. I could be available, whatever works for you. So sure. All that right. Well, good. let's, Let's wrap it up here with Carl Sagan. Thank you so much, Mike, for organizing this. Thank you for your time. I love your diligence. I, I know I don't say this just because there's people listening, but I know you've taken a lot of heat, brother, for standing up for the truth in, in difficult circumstances. And I just pray you're blessed for that. Uh, it's, it's never easy 
uh, but I do know that um, it seems that every person who ever tried to stand up for the truth encountered similar resistance and pushback from the very people that that loved them and and that um, is maybe just something that we expect but I I just pray that your strength would be increased and your blessings would uh, flow out for your diligence through all this I appreciate it and maybe you can uh get your camera working so we can see your face on the, on the next yeah one. okay i i even showered and shaved today just for this <laughs> but it's okay i got a new battery coming monday so it'll it'll work and we'll we'll get the rest the second half will be uh with video that'll work all well. right what do you say Corey? what do we remember oh my gosh hey just remember through all this uh, we are just here trying to love each other and we are just walking each other home amen god bless, bless.